Good afternoon kids, it's Mrs Sparks here. Now some of you have been preparing for the UK Maths Challenge next week and you've been going through some practice questions on their website. There are 25 questions in total. I'm going to go through the first 15 now and then I'll run through the final 10 in a different video. So let's get started. Um, I know these ones are fairly straightforward, but we'll just run through them very quickly because it's still easy to make mistakes, particularly when you are at the start of a um, challenge or test. Okay, so quick number line. We've got 23.35 here. Okay, we could put midnight here or double zero, double zero. We've got 0100 here. And then finally, we've got 0115. OK, nice and easy. We can see we've got 15 minutes there. We've got 25 minutes there. We've got an hour between midnight and one. So we've got 60 minutes there. If we add all of those together, 25, 15 and 60 is going to give us 100 minutes. So the answer is A. OK, let's move on to question two. So we have um, an expression here. So we have 0.1 plus 0.2 plus 0.3. So we've got 0.6. We're subtracting 0.4 and we're dividing all of it by 0 0.5. Let's see what we can do next. So we know we've got 0 0.2 here. Remember our division sign we can write as a fraction. So 0 0.2 divided by 0 0.5. Now we need to find an equivalent fraction to get rid of those decimals. So if we could, well, we can just double it, can't we? We could multiply the numerator and denominator by two. That's going to give you 0 0.4 as your numerator, one as your denominator, which gives you 0.4. Question three. Okay, so Sam has eaten three quarters of the grapes and the question is the ratio of the number of grapes that remain to the number of grapes that have been eaten. So the remaining grapes to the eaten grapes. The eaten grapes are three quarters. The ones that remain are therefore one quarter so I can multiply both sides by four. That gives me one to three. So the answer is the first one. It is A. Question four. Okay, so we want to cut this shape and get four separate pieces by doing it. So just looking through them, very difficult for A, B, C or D to get anything other than two pieces. However, if we just do one single cut like that through piece E, we get one, two, three, four pieces. Question five. Now, Ify is 16 and Buster is three times as old. So Buster is 42. No, he's not. He's 48. Sorry. Pressure of doing it live on camera. Okay, so if is 16, Buster is 48. Let's write that again so you can read it. In five years' time, if is going to be 21. And in five years' time, Buster is going to be 53. So we're adding... Five. So your answer is C, 53. Question six. Right, the number closest to seven, remember with all of the UK Maths Challenge questions, you've got a choice of five answers. Okay, so you can use those numbers to help you. In this case, we know that 7.17 is bigger than 7.09, so we can get rid of that. And we know that 7.09 is bigger than 7.085, so I can get rid of that. Let's look at the numbers that start with six. 
we know that 6.7 is less than 6.918, so I can get rid of that. I've now just got two choices. I've got 6.918 and I've got 7.085. So I know that 7.085 is 0 0.085 away from 7. And 7 subtract 6.918 is going to give me 0 0.082. So I can see, therefore, that 6.918 is the closest to 7. Question 7. Now, the key word here is the word approximately. I don't have to do any exact calculations. I can work out things approximately. I am told that the Trans-Canada Highway is 7,821 kilometres long. However, the shortest street in the UK is only 2.06 metres long. First thing we need to do is we need to sort out these units. We've got kilometres and we've got metres. To convert kilometres into metres, we need to multiply by 1,000. So we've got 7821 over 2.06. But at the start, I said to use this word approximately. So I'm going to make this 8 million. Let's make it much easier. And I'm going to make this 2. So 8 million divided by 2 gives me... 4 million. Can you see that? 8 million divided by 2 gives me 4 million. Let's keep going. Question 8. Okay, we're trying to find the size of the angle FPG. So it's this angle here. Okay, we've got a triangle here. We know that a triangle sums to 180. So we know that if we add these two angles together, 120 and 35, that's going to give me 155. And if I subtract that from 180, it's going to give me 25 degrees. So I can write 25 degrees here. Now, this is exactly the same. It's symmetrical. So, oh, I'm sorry, that should be there. Okay, and that is also 25 degrees. So now I just need to work out what this angle is here and subtract the 50 degrees from it. I'm given this angle here is 120. I know that this is a rhombus and therefore these two lines are parallel and these two lines are also parallel. So I know that 120 plus SPQ is going to sum to 180. Or I could sum all the angles inside my rhombus to get the sum of SPQ and SRQ and then divide by 2. But because I know that co-interior angles sum to 180, I can just take my 180, I can subtract my 120 and that gives me 60 degrees. Okay, you can't quite see that so let me move it up a little bit. Okay, we're nearly there. So we know that this total angle here is 60. I've got to subtract these two lots of 25. So I've got 60, subtract 50, gives me 10 degrees. And that is my answer. Let's take a look at question nine. So some of us might be able to look at 50% of 18.3 and see straight away that it's 9.15. Um, some of us might look at 18.3% and use a little bit of approximation and say that's about 20%. I can probably work out what 20% of 50 is quite easily. But maybe we don't need to do those calculations. Let's take a look and see if there's an easier way. So we can write 50% as a fraction, 50 out of 100. We can write our of as a multiplication sign and 18.3. Sometimes we put that over one just to make sure that we don't make any mistakes when multiplying out. We're now adding 18.3% of, so we're multiplying, of 50. And again, we're going to write that over one. 
But we know, we know that 3 times 6 is exactly the same as 6 times 3. So let's have a look at this and see if we can rearrange it. Maybe we don't need to do any calculating. So here we know we've got half multiplied by 18.3. We're going to leave that over one there. And on this side, I'm going to rearrange it. So I've got 50 over 100 multiplied by 18.3 over 1. Again, if I simplify this down, I'm going to have a half of 18.3. And I'm adding one half of 18.3. So hopefully we can therefore see that the answer is simply 18.3. Can you see that? Okay. All right. So your answer to question nine is B. Let's move on to question 10. Now, I have to say, I found this one of the most challenging questions out of all the practice questions. So let's have a read of the question and see if we can interpret what it's saying. So what is the last digit of the smallest positive integer whose digits add up to 2019? Now, let's think about what that's saying for a moment. If every single digit in our number was 1, and they summed, they added up to 2019. I'd have 2019 ones in a row, wouldn't I? I'd have an enormously long number. So really what we want to do is we want to have the biggest integer possible. So we want a load of nines, etc. So our starting point is to take our 2019 and divide it by 9 to work out how many integers we need. So we have 224 and then we're left with a remainder of 3. So we now know in our number we have 224 of the digit 9. But we've also got this number three that we need to put in there as well. And we can put that anywhere we like. We can put it at the start, at the end, or somewhere in the middle. But if we go back to the question, it asks us for the smallest positive integer. So if we're looking for the smallest number, we need to put that three at the start, which means all the other numbers are nine, which means the last number is nine. As I say, that was a tough question, so please don't worry if you struggled on that one. Question 11, we're playing a game, we want to make sure we're going to win. So we need to look at the strategy that's involved. We can put a 1 or a 2 or a 3 if in any of the circles. And with this is the state that we're at and we want to know how to win. So with these, you could put a 3 here and a three here, and it satisfies all the criteria. So that doesn't work. With this one, you could put a two here and a three here. You are not gonna beat your opponents. Maybe look at this one. We could put a two here. That would force a one there, but no, because we could put a three there. So that's not gonna work either. Let's take a look at this one. If we put a 3 here, then we are going to force our opponents to fill in this circle. They can't use a 1 because it connects here, or a 2 because of this connection, or a 3 because of this connection. So that's our correct answer. We can just double check here if anything different could have happened here. So with this one, you could put um, a one here, but there'd still be the opportunity to go in there with a three. So the answer for question 11 is D. Okay, question 12. We have a sequence of six integers. 
I'm going to write them out again. 8, 13, 25. Now, the question tells us each term is the sum of the three previous terms. So if I look at this, I know that these three terms here, when I add these three numbers together, I'm going to get 25. So I know that 8 plus 13 gives us 21. So I'm going to need 4 here. 4 plus 8 plus 13 gives me my 25. I'm now going to look at these three numbers. These three, num three numbers need to sum to 13. So something plus 4 plus 8 gives us 13. So that is going to be 1. Let's look at the final option. Something plus 1 plus 4 gives us 8. So this number here has to be 3. Now there are ways obviously of solving this algebraically as well. But I think for the purpose of the maths challenge, this is probably going to be the quickest way to do it. So question 12. Question 13. We want to work out how many different ways we can spell out JMC. We have the J in the middle. We've only got one J, so we can't really do much with that. We can effectively ignore it. We're now going to look at the M's. Now we've got an M here which can connect potentially to three different C's. And we have four of those M's. So we have four M's that can connect to three C's each. There's only one J, so that's going to give us 12. Now let's look at the M's that are here. Now this M can connect up here, 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 here and here. It's actually got five connections. Again, we've still only got one J, but we've got four blue M's. And each of those can connect to five different C's. So our answer for question 13 is 32. Question 14. We want to make the longest path possible, but we can only pass each vertex once. So we need to be really careful if we start here, for example, and go around this triangle, we can only do two sides until we end up back here. So we need to think really carefully about where we start. If we start here, we could go up or down, but we are still limited. We would stop there or we would stop there. So if we start here at the top of the triangle, we can go one, two, three, four, five, six. We definitely don't want to go down there. Seven, eight, nine, and 10. So the longest path that we can make without revisiting any vertex is 10 centimeters. Finally, question 15. So we want to, we've got this shape here. We want to place it on our grid. I've put some extra grids in here to help us. So if we look at the first way we can put it in. Okay. So our circle is going to be here. And then you can have a second shape here, third shape here, fourth shape here. So you can see that if this shape was here, you could rotate it round. So the circle can be at the top, so, uh, third one along. The circle can be here. And the circle can be here. So that allows us to put in our first lot of circles. So we can rotate to there, to here and to here. All right, that's our first pattern. Let's think what else we could do in terms of where we put our shape. We could put it the other way. Let's see. So 
so we can have this one shaded again I can rotate that round and you can see that all four of these can be shaded what else so let's maybe just put those here so we can see what else we need to try and create what about the corners can we get the corners shaded let's try that so to get a corner shaded we need to have one that goes like this okay and then again you can see that means all four of my corners can be shaded as I rotate the shape round so I've got these four okay we're nearly there well I think the last one is probably fairly straightforward because it's just um, very similar to this one that we did here but let's just draw it in for completeness this would be our fourth one like so with a circle there so we can colour in this one as you rotate it around this one and this one and this one and remember when you are in your math challenge there is nothing to stop you physically turning the piece of paper around to help you so you'll see we've got all 16 squares with a circle in so our solution to that question is 16. Question 16. Tamsin writes down three two-digit two integers. One is square, one is prime, and one is triangular. So three two-digit numbers. And she's using the digits three to eight once each. The question is, which prime number does she write? And we have a choice of five answers. Remember in the UK Maths Challenge, we can use the answers to help us. So let's look at square numbers that are two digits long. So if I write down the square numbers that are two digits long, we have 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, and 81. Well we can already get rid of some of those because they have to contain the digits 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 or 8. So I can get rid of 16 and 25 and I can get rid of 81 and I can get rid of 49. So there's only two choices when it comes to my square number and they both have a 6 in them. Okay, let's now look at the triangular numbers. Okay, so our triangular numbers go up 1, 3, 6, 10. So 10 is our first two-digit number. And then we add on 5 to get 15. We add on 6 to get 21. We add on 7 to get 28. We add on 8 to get 36. We add on 9 to get 45. We add on 10 to get 55. We add on 11 to get 66. We add on 12 to get 78. And we add on, finally, 13 to get 91. Again, we can cross out quite a few of these. All the numbers below 30 we can cross out. We can cross out 91. But also, we have to only use each digit once. So we can get rid of 55 and we can get rid of 66. So we've got a choice of 36, 45 and 78. But remember we said up here that both of these solutions had a 6 in them. So we can't have a 6 in our triangular number. So let's get rid of 36. So we've got two potential solutions for our square number two potential solutions for our triangular number so now we're going to just use a process of trial and error so if we had 36 as our square number then our triangular number would either be 45 or 
78 for our triangular number. That means the two digits that are remaining here for our prime number, we've used three, four, five, six. So our prime number would be 78 or 87. Well, they're not prime numbers. Eight plus seven is 15. 15 is a multiple of three. Therefore, they are both in the three times table. Let's look here. We've got three, six, seven, and eight. So we're missing four and five, or 45 or 54. Neither of those are prime numbers. So that solution doesn't work. So we now need to look at the 64. So if 64, if 64 was our square number, then again, we'd have a choice of 45 or 78 for our triangular number, but we can't have the four twice. So our triangular number would have to be 78. So let's look at the digits that have not been used. The three has not been used and the five has not been used. So we can have 35 or we can have 53. 35 obviously is not a prime number and 53 is our solution. That was question 16. Question 17. I find it really helpful if you draw out questions like this. So I've got a rectangle that is three times as long as it is high. And let's just make it X and 3X. I don't know if that will be helpful yet. We will see. Now, I've got the area of a square. So I've got a square now. And the area of my square is 12 times the area of my rectangle. So I need to go back to my rectangle and work out the area. So I've got 3x multiplied by x. That gives me 3x squared. That's the area of my rectangle. The area of my square is 12 times that much. So I've got 3 times 12, which gives me 36x, sorry, 3 3x squared multiplied by 12 gives me 36x squared. Let me write that so you can read it. 3x squared multiplied by 12 gives us 36x squared. So we now need to work out what the side length is of our square. So we need to square root 36x squared. So the square root of 36 is 6. The square root of x squared is x. So we have our square with side length 6x. Now let's finish it off. We want to work out the perimeter so that we can work out the ratio of the perimeter of the square to the perimeter of the rectangle. So the perimeter of the square is four lots of 6x. So I've got 24 x that's the perimeter of my square and then the perimeter of my rectangle is going to be 3x plus x plus 3x plus x so 8x is going to be the perimeter of my rectangle i need to write it as a ratio perimeter of the square to the perimeter of the rectangle. So my square is 24x, my rectangle is 8x, so I can simplify that down to 3 to 1. The x's cancel out. So we have D as the answer for question 17. Question 18, we want to work out what fraction of the integers from 1 to 8,000 inclusive are cubes. Now we could write out all the cube numbers from 1 to 8,000, but that would take quite a long time. So I'm thinking there must be an easier way. And I know that 1 cubed is 1. And I know that 2 cubed is 8 and so on. 
all the way up to something cubed. I don't know what it is yet, but that something when I cube it is 8,000. Now there's a couple of different ways I, I can look at this. I could look at the cube root of 8,000 and say, well, I'm gonna split that up into the cube root of eight multiplied by the cube root of 1,000. And I could say, well, that's okay, because I know that the cube root of eight is two, and I know the cube root of 1,000 is 10, and that's going to give me 20. So I know that 20 cubed gives me 8,000. If I'm not quite sure about that, I could just look at that 8,000 and say, well, I know that 10 times 10 times 10 is 1,000. Let's try 20 times 20 times 20, or 15 times 15 times 15, and use a little bit of trial and improvement to get to that 8,000. But if you can remember how to split out um, your number to turn it into two cube numbers, it will make the process a little bit easier. Let's go back to the question. So we now know that there are 20 cube numbers between one and 8,000. So 20 cube numbers out of 8,000 integers. I can simplify that down by dividing the numerator and denominator by 10. That's going to give me two over 800. So I've divided the numerator and denominator by 10. And then I'm finally going to divide the numerator and denominator by two, which gives me one over 400 or C. Question 18. Question 19, a bit like a Sudoku challenge here. So let's have a look. We need to work out what X can be. Let's write down the numbers that we have. We know that within this group of six numbers, X cannot be five and X cannot be six. What else can we work out? We know that if we look at this column here, we can't, this can't be two or four, and this number can't be two or four, okay? So it could be one, it could be three, but it can't be five and it can't be six. So it's, we don't know which way around they are, but we know it's got to be one or three. Now let's take a look at this number here. Maybe if we go down here and have a look here and what's going to go into this number here. Well, if we look at this block of six, we know that there's a two on this bottom row. So two can't be here or here. We can't have a two there and we can't have a two there. When we look at this column, we know that we can't have a two here because we've got that two there. So that means that this number here must be two. So if this number here must be two, this number here cannot be two. Now we already know that we've used up the one and three, even though we don't know which one is which. We know that this cannot be two, so it's going to have to be four which means that X is going to be two. Okay, we're gonna do question 20 and then the last five questions will be on a new video. Question 20, Emily writes down the largest two digit prime such that each of its digits is prime. Okay, so we want the single digits that are prime numbers to start with. So let's write those out. Remembering, of course, that one is not a prime number. So we have two, three, five, and seven. Nine is also not a prime number. So we've got four choices. So now we need to write down the various different combinations that we can have of these four numbers, remembering that we are creating a prime number. Well, the largest number we can create is 75, but that's not a prime number. 
the next largest number we can create is 73. 73 is a prime number. Now, Chris is writing down the smallest two-digit prime number. And again, each of its digits is prime. So we've still got that same choice of four numbers, two, three, five, and seven, but we want the smallest number. Well, we can see that 23 is our smallest number and 23 is also prime. So the last step is to subtract Krish's number from Emily's number. So we have 73, we're going to subtract 23 and we are left with 50. That's question 20. Five more questions to go. They'll be on a third video. Thank you so much for listening. I hope it helps and good luck for your UK Maths Challenge. We're down to the last five questions. As you know, the last five questions are the most challenging ones in the UK Maths Challenge. So let's see how we get on. So we've got a hexagon, a square and an equilateral triangle. So let's make a note of what we know. So we've got a regular hexagon, so all six sides are the same length. The square, therefore, ha all has um, the same length sides as the hexagon, and the equilateral triangle is the same. Okay, so we know we've got 90 degrees here. We know the internal angles of a hexagon are 120 degrees. If we can't remember, remember it's N subtract 2 multiplied by 180 degrees. So four times 180 gives us 720. That is the sum of the internal angles of the hexagon. We then need to take that 720 and divide it by the number of interior angles, which is six, and that gives us our 120 degrees. So we know that all of these angles are 120 degrees. We know that the interior angles of our equilateral are 60 degrees. We know that these side lengths are all the same and therefore this here is an equilateral, um, is an isosceles triangle. We know that this angle here again is 120. And we know that this is 90. So we now know that this angle here is 30 degrees. Given that this is 30 degrees, we can work out what these two angles here are. So we've got 180 subtract 30 gives us 150 degrees. 150 divided by 2 gives us 75 degrees. So we know these two angles in here are 75 degrees each. Right, what else do we know? So now we know that this is 75 degrees. We know the total is 120. We can do 120, subtract that 75, which tells us that this angle here is 45 degrees. So we've got VRS is 45 degrees. What else do we still need to work out? We've got 120 here, we've got 45 here. We're trying to find the angle XVR. So we're trying to find this angle here. So we've still got one more angle to find. We want to find this angle here. Okay, what else can we prove or demonstrate now? We might be able to see, can we prove, for example, that this side of the equilateral triangle and this side of our hexagon is parallel? Well, luckily we can. We can also look at angles around a point summing to 360 degrees because we've got 90 degrees here. We've got 60 degrees here and we've got 75 there. So it looks like we've got enough to go without having to prove that those lines are parallel. So let's have a go. So we have 90 degrees plus 60 degrees 
plus 75 degrees. So that gives us 225 degrees. Finally, we know angles around a point 7 to 360, 360 degrees, subtract 225 degrees, gives us 135 degrees. So our answer, therefore, is D. Those lines are parallel, by the way, but we don't need to go into the proof of that. We can work it out through angles around a point. Question 22. Tough question. OK, we have a four digit number that we're multiplying by nine to get a four digit number. So the biggest that four digit number can be, although it does say that they're different digits, the biggest that number could be would be 9,999. Or with different digits, it would have to be 9,876. Okay. That means, let's go with the biggest number for now to make the maths easy. That means that that number there would have had to be 1,111 multiplied by 9 to get our 9,999. Well, we know we can't do that because it says all the digits are different. So that means we need a number that is smaller than 1,111 and it has to have four digits and the first digit has to be one. That means the only other digit that R can be for this whole number to be less than 1,111, the R must be zero. And we don't need to worry about calculating what the A and the P may be. The question is, what is the value of R? R must be zero. Question 23. Remember, it's nothing to stop you turning your piece of paper if you find it's helpful. We've got two squares. The larger square has a side length of six centimetres. And the small square has a side length of four centimetres. We are also told that vertex K is the midpoint of RS. So that means that we can say that that is two centimetres and this here is two centimetres. Now, just viewing it for a moment, the easiest way to work out the area is to turn this into a triangle. Remembering that this bit here is four, so our overall length there of our triangle is 10. And on this side, we've got four plus another four here. So we've got eight. So the area of our blue triangle, whoops, equals 10 multiplied by eight. Don't forget to divide it by two. Gives us our 40 centimetres squared base times height divided by two for the area of a triangle. But we're not finished yet. We have to subtract this square here. So now we've got to do the area of the green square, four multiplied by four, which is our 16 centimetres squared. And then finally, we just need to subtract our 16 from our 40 and we get 24 centimetres squared or answer B. Just out of interest, when I discussed this with my daughter, she looked at it and she knew the overall area was 36 for this square and 16 for this square. And she knew that the shaded area was less than half. So she knew that exactly half was 26 centimetres squared. So she knew, without doing any calculations really, that she'd narrowed it down to a choice of two for the shaded area. Okay, two to go. 
they don't get any easier I have to say as we go through them but let's see how we get on with this one okay so let's have a look at this we want to work out which of these five expressions equals this here. And if we look at these five expressions, four of them have got Q in them. So whatever we do with this, we need to somehow express P, R, S and T in terms of either Q or as a number. Now when we look at this, we've got this isosceles triangle here. So that would be R. And then we've got an identical isosceles triangle here where this angle is S. So we know that R equals S. Maybe that will be helpful. We'll find out in a moment. Okay, and we can also see that these external angles of our heptagon are also equal. Maybe that will be helpful. Q equals T. Well, that is quite useful for a start because we can get rid of that T, can't we? And we can turn that into Q. We've got a Q here. And let's look now what we've got left. We've got a P, an R and an S. So we want to work out what P plus R plus S is. But we know, we know that R and S are the same. They're interchangeable. So let's turn that into P plus 2R. Okay, now let's take a look at this triangle here. We know that this is P, that's our interior angle, so that angle there is also P. So P plus 2R, that's the sum of the internal angles of our triangle, that's 180 degrees. Brilliant. So let's go back to this and maybe let's write it out a little bit more neatly. So we had... P plus R plus S plus Q plus T. We've worked out that P plus R plus S is 180 degrees. We know that Q is Q, but we also know that T is the same as Q. So we can simply write it as 180 plus 2Q. That gives us answer. Last question, we're nearly there and I am shattered, I don't know about you. Question 25, let's read through the question. It shows that the first 15 positive integers are arranged in a triangle, so numbers 1 to 15. Let's write that down, see if it's useful. Now, the numbers are arranged so that the five integers along the edge of the triangle have the same sum. So the sum of those five numbers needs to be the same as the sum of those five numbers, which needs to be the same as those five numbers. However, we also need to make the greatest possible sum. So... Let's just sketch it out and see what it's going to look like. So we've got 15 numbers. We've numbered 1 to 15 there to help us. And we want to make the greatest sum possible. So let's get rid of the three smallest numbers and put those in the middle. And let's keep the largest three numbers and put those in the corners because then each of those three largest numbers is going to get counted twice. We're left with these numbers in the middle. Let's add them up. So four plus 12 is 16, five plus 11 is 16, six plus 10 is 16, seven plus nine is 16. So I know that that's 16, 32. 64, but I've also got this 8 here, so then I need to do 64, add on the 8, that gives me 72. And I know that those numbers have got to be distributed here along the three sides of the triangle. So I'm going to do 72 divided by 3, which gives me 24. So I know that on average, these three numbers need to sum 
to 24. But remember, we've got to make sure that these sides on each edge, that they must all have the same sum. So if this side currently sums to 29, this side currently sums to 28, and this side currently sums to 27, then on this side I need to add one more, this side I need to add one less, and this side I'm going to add exactly 24. Now I don't really mind what the numbers are, I don't need that for the question, so I'm just going to say the sum of those three is 24, the sum of these three is one less, so it's 23, and the sum of these three is one more, which is 25. Let's double check that that's correct. So we've got 28 plus 24, that gives me 52. 29 plus 23, that also gives me 52. And finally, 27 plus 25 also gives me 52. So there is my answer, 52. We have finished. You all deserve a break and all the best for your UK Maths Challenge. I hope you absolutely smash it next week. Good luck. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.